Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Shubhran Shu. I head sales for uh, Griffin India for Credit Bureau Analytics and Software. Uh, pleasure to have you all uh, on this webinar where we are going to look at uh, certain actions that you can take on your portfolios, especially in these times of uh, VUCA, uh, to uh, actually set up your portfolios for future growth in a sustainable manner. Uh, we will wait for about five minutes uh, to allow other people to uh, join in. Uh, uh, and then we will uh, start the webinar. The way we will do the webinar is to go through the content in about uh, 30, 35 minutes, 40 minutes at max. Uh, at any point in this uh, conversation, if you have a question, please use the chat facility to post the questions. I repeat, please use the chat facility to pose the question. We will uh, try to keep about uh, 10 to 15 minutes to answer the questions that you have. And uh, we will try to answer them as, uh, uh, as many questions as possible. Uh, you will understand that some of the questions require a detailed conversation. So in the possibility that we are not able to answer your question, uh, we will get back to you uh, over email with the answer to that question. Uh, if you have any questions post this webinar, uh, the email ID to send that question is interact, I-N-T-E-R-A-C-T, at CRIFHIGHMARK, C-R-I-F-H-I-G-H-M-A-R-K.com. Uh, so we'll wait for about uh, the next three minutes before we begin the webinar. So we will uh, wait for another couple of minutes uh, before we start, uh, just to allow uh, people to uh, join in.
okay so uh, let's start setting the context i, I think uh, we need to see this uh, time of uh, volatility uncertainty complexity and ambiguity which is what is the term vuca uh, as an opportunity to take a pause to identify what are the uh, possible set of actions that we can take better uh, to fuel sustainable growth in our portfolios. And I keep saying that this is an opportunity because from the demand side, it is not that the demand suppression is going to continue for a very long period of time. It may continue a little bit into the medium term, but certainly not into the longer medium term and definitely not into the long term. From a supply side, the advantages that you possess in terms of distribution, in terms of familiarity of bo with borrowers, those advantages place you uniquely uh, to be able to actually emerge as the preferred lending partner uh, to service the life cycle credit needs when the demand suppression uh, reverses. And the intent of this conversation today that we are going to have is to look at how we have arrived at this point and then to look at certain actions that we as CRIF believe you may already be doing, but you need to internalize as structural actions that will actually help you uh, set up your portfolios for sustainable growth. So with that context, I will start and I will start uh, broadly by uh, broadly by uh, uh, looking at some trended observations on the MFI portfolio. So the microfinance portfolio has witnessed, uh, of course, a significant amount of growth uh, uh, post the demonetization. You will see that the growth rates are very very high it's 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 almost back to the pre-demo growth rates what we also see is that because of the write-offs that were taken on the portfolio a new normal in delinquency has emerged and a new normal essentially is at about one percent or 1.2 percent which was flat till the point you had the events coming in between september 19 and december 19 which which showed uh, the spike. Now, if we actually deep dive into what is contributing to the growth, we will see that although some part of the growth is driven by new to credit, the majority of the growth is actually driven by increased ticket sizes and increased number of lenders from whom borrowers are borrowing. And therefore, the pertinent question is actually to look at the portfolio or more importantly look at the customers in the portfolio and see what are they doing that's the first question the second question is to say that is this flatness really because of the denominator effect or is the numerator actually flat in terms of the delinquency now as we were saying over a period of 24 months or eight quarters of observation we see two things one is that the average ticket size which is the at the door dispersal size that has increased and along with that we are also seeing that the average debt being serviced by your mfi borrower considering only the mfi portfolio is also increasing now, of course, a part of this is, is driven by regulatory levers and the regulatory levers broadly in my mind are two. One is the allowance to lend more, the allowance to borrow from more, more lenders. And the second, of course, is conversion of some of the MFIs into small finance banks and full service banks. As I said, the key thing, I, I think the key thing from a portfolio standpoint is that per se, despite this, the percentage basis point impact on the 31 to 180 delinquency, and I repeat, the percentage basis point impact on the 31 to 180 stays immaterial.
now if you look at a trend in terms of the delinquency and if you can if you start observing it from march 17 which is which is essentially the post demo when the lending started the lending started in around feb 17 so you observe from march 17 and you look at it uh, trended over 24 months you will see that uh, right off peaked at around march 18 uh, you will see that uh, because the late delinquency and the early delinquency both those trends actually started flattening out uh, uh, the late delinquency and the early delinquency both those trends actually started flattening out towards the later half of uh financial year 17 18. now this tells us two things one is that the book grew the book grew significantly uh from the second half of financial year 17 18 onwards till now as a result of which the uh the early delinquency and the late delinquency trends flattened it also tells us that because of the write-off uh we were able to arrive at the new normal now the question if you remember the, the the statement that i made was that basis if you consider only percentage basis points the delinquency looks immaterial irrespective of an increase in debt irrespective of borrowers borrowing from more lenders now that basis point is actually a percentage which means that a deeper examination or a truer examination is actually by looking at the growth rate in the numerator and looking at the growth rate of the denominator to say that whether the denominator is actually crowding out the numerator so what you will see is of course across different kind of lender segments the 30 to 90 delinquency growth quarter on quarter in terms of absolute value is increasing you will also see that the same observation is existing even for the 91 to 180 bucket now you will also see to some extent uh, uh, so let me let me come back to uh, what are you saying so so if you look at this chart right this is tracking the percent uh, this is tracking the absolute growth in delinquency that is the value that is lying between 30 days past you to 90 days past you in every quarter this trend is increasing since june 19 across all lender types the same observation is true for the 91 to 180 from june 19 to december 19. now we are trying to answer the question as to whether the percentage delinquency of 31 to 180 that was flattening at about 1 percent to 1.2 percent was that because of the fact that the delinquency was not increasing or was that because of the fact that the numerate that the denominator was increasing so much that any increase in delinquency was actually getting flattened out now if you look at and therefore an important thing to look at is how did the denominator grow that is how did the portfolio number grow now you will see that the portfolio number is also showing a certain amount of degrowth across certain customer segments from june 19 onwards to december 19. so what this tells us and i will go back a couple of slides is the fact that this number over here this trend that is there in terms of an early delinquency in terms of a late delinquency in terms of portfolio that number when viewed with a little bit of portfolio shrinkage the likelihood of that number going up is high 
what it also means is that the percentage basis point staying flat is a is a necessary information but is not a sufficient information and that led us to examine in greater detail as to why is this happening because traditionally the view in looking at microfinance has been to look at microfinance as a portfolio now the borrowers who contribute to this portfolio is there a need to look at microfinance not as a portfolio not as a value but in terms of the borrowers who contribute to that value are the borrower needs being serviced only by microfinance institutions or are the borrower needs being serviced by other lender categories as well are the and therefore from a borrower standpoint from my customer segment standpoint am i taking a structural action and a structural action essentially is a set of actions which are done repeatedly which are done uh, recurringly which may be done concurrently to understand the customers who contribute to my portfolio now our responsibility to you is to show you data to create a use case for you to adopt those actions which today may be incidental actions as structural actions so let us look at some data the first question that we try to answer is are my microfinance borrowers solely microfinance borrowers so today we have what slightly more than about 6 crore active borrowers now 20% of them or 1.2 crore borrowers are not just borrowing microfinance loans or what you call as il they are borrowing traditional retail asset loans that not that percentage is a very significant percentage it indicates both a demand side lever and a supply side lever which is changing the behavior of your borrower that is contributing to the portfolio next thing to look at is to say that who are the kind of borrowers to whom who contribute to this 20% are these fourth cycle fifth cycle borrowers or are these first cycle second cycle third cycle borrowers so out of this 20% so out of this 1.2 crore you will see that a fairly significant percent of borrowers who are taking loans outside microfinance have microfinance vintage of less than 12 months which means that these are first cycle borrowers from a portfolio standpoint what does it mean it means that you have the opportunity to understand them more you also have the you also have to be cognizant of the fact that these are people who carry a residual risk which may come to your microfinance portfolio and i spoke about this less than 12 months or first cycle because new to credit sourcing in microfinance has increased by a growth rate of 28% in the last two years it means what it means that post demonetization you have consciously looked out for new to credit borrowers and you have brought them into the system and they are now taking loans from outside microfinance i have made the second point and i will make this point again that if you look at the last 12 months or the last 15 18 months for that matter of fact the percentage of first time mfi borrowers who were offered or who took a non mfi loan within the first 12 to 15 months is high the 44% is a percentage but directionally that number has been increasing and that number will continue to increase so 
referring back to the previous section the point is that from both and from a risk standpoint definitely looking at the basis points or even the absolute delinquency on the microfinance book is actually looking is actually uh, not looking at the residual risk that your portfolio is carrying that residual risk is material because one in five of microfinance borrowers are borrowing from are borrowing a non microfinance loan and non microfinance loan does not mean an individual loan it means a traditional retail asset loan they are borrowing a non microfinance loan and today because of the fact that such a large percentage of borrowers have actually gone out and borrowed i think as organizations you cannot say that you are immune to this phenomenon that is the first thing that is the first structural decision to take that to bring immunity from this you need to recognize this as an opportunity you also need to see the risk that your portfolio is today carrying because your borrowers have been reached out by other lender categories and are being offered different kind of loans the next construct that is worth looking at is whether this behavior is actually predominant in urban is predominant in rural is it does it happen with borrowers who take microfinance loans from ndfc mfis does it happen with borrowers who take microfinance loans from sfbs does it happen from borrowers who take microfinance loans from banks the answer to that is it happens universally this is a representation of the top 10 states and where the non microfinance loans are given so if you look at a state like bihar like which is predominantly which is predominantly rural you will see that cross sell happens also on rural so for us we need to break down the notion that the microfinance borrower takes only microfinance loan first we need to break down the notion that even if that microfinance borrower is taking a non microfinance loan that behavior is seen only in urban and i say that we need to break down this notion because as i keep repeating this is an opportunity but this is a risk based opportunity and not a rule based opportunity so this clearly tells you that the opportunity exists the behavior is across geographies the behavior does not carry any bias from where you actually take a microfinance loan now the other thing that you must know is what are the kind of loans they are being given because if crif today comes and tells you that the opportunity exists we must also tell you that what are the other kind of credit mix that uh, your borrowers are taking so that you can identify if that opportunity actually exists or not exists so the first thing to see is actually that in terms of uh, ticket sizes your uh, your uh, borrowers are actually working significantly in segments which are less than 40k couple this with the fact that your borrowers used to traditionally take housing loans or business loans but today an increase is also being seen in terms of personal loan including consumer durable loans in terms of commercial vehicle loans which means that they are actually borrowing for a forward integration into the supply chain or for that matter of fact an od which is essentially cash flow financing this is essentially telling you that the needs that are coming are a mixture of consumption driven loans which is actually this part this uh, 4.02% this light orange personal loan and a mixture of production driven loans which is a commercial vehicle loans or an overdraft 
that is the change in pattern that we are seeing historically you will recall that most of your uh, most of your borrowers used to take gold loans but look at how this number is shrinking that number is shrinking because of the increase in certain production driven categories over here which is this 18.95 uh, business loan plus this 4.3 commercial vehicle loans plus this 1.72 which is an od as well as consumption driven categories which is 4.02 which is a personal loan 30.75 which is a, a housing loan so the point uh, to be noted over here is that even though you have the possibility uh, to use the NBFC MFI specifically, have the possibility to use 15% of your portfolio in non qualifying assets. If you look at data and that data that you have contributed in terms of what is your proportion of non qualifying assets that percentage is still low number one uh, number two is that your borrowers because of this change are actually taking money from other lender categories using that money across consumption and production and in some cases are also offering security of an immovable asset to the other lender which means that in case of riskiness coming on the other lenders portfolio their recourse is very high whether you look at commercial vehicle which is a movable asset or a housing loan so that is a change that has happened and that change again you need to be aware of uh, as a as a lever that your portfolio is uh, seeing so the next question that you may ask is that okay so what how does it make a difference to my portfolio per se it does not because the left hand side are essentially is a representation of district level 31 to 180 delinquencies for borrowers who borrow only microfinance loan the right hand graph is actually the same parameter 31 to 180 borrowers who borrow microfinance and other loans how do they repay on microfinance so this is comparing delinquency on the microfinance portfolio and the microfinance portfolio and you will see that the picture is very similar so delinquency on the mfi portfolio today is indifferent but if you look at in terms of overall borrowing overall borrowing this graph is this this left is the same left borrowers who borrow only microfinance how do they repay on all their loans the right graph is different the right graph is different because this is saying borrowers who borrow microfinance plus non microfinance how do they repay on all their loans and this number is very different and this number is not different because the overall value of borrowing is less so microfinance let's say as of december 19 was 2 lakh crores or a little more than that this portfolio is more than 3 lakh crores which means that the portfolio size is comparable or more these are the same borrowers who are not repaying others and who are repaying you and every time you go to acquire a borrower there is a one in five chance that that borrower actually lies somewhere over here and not over here so the question therefore is how do you look at your portfolio do you look at your portfolio as the sum of the total loans that have been given by you 
or do you look at your portfolio as the sum of the borrowers to whom you have given the loans and that is a very different uh, way of approaching this pause because if you look at it from the first view you are approaching this pause purely by purely by uh, taking a position that when when the pause uh, finishes the actions that you need to take on your portfolio are the actions that you have taken till now but if you approach the portfolio as a sum of your customers you will understand that one in five actually lie over here you will try to understand what are the products that they are taking outside you will try to understand whether uh, whether those products are uh how different are those products from what you do and therefore what of those products can you actually do so that you increase your business with the borrower because even as an nvfc mfi you have a 15 percent headroom to do that so just to summarize your portfolio today is witnessing the following levers the effects of the following levers you have a higher percentage of new to credit you have increased debt levels in your borrowers you have a material increase in delinquencies when measured of four weekly payment cycle misses you have borrowers who have who now have exposure to more lenders not just microfinance but other kind of lenders you have borrowers who have exposure to different credit mix and you have repeated external events on your portfolio so what are portfolio actions to understand what are portfolio actions you must understand what are the customer segments the first level of segmentation is essentially two kinds of cohorts people who are borrowing only mfi loans people who are borrowing mfi plus non mfi in these cohorts you today have moratorium opt-ins you have moratorium opt-outs and even in these opt-outs you have moratorium requested but not given and therefore for you to take a portfolio action at a customer level you must know what who what percentage of your people are good with you only are good with you and good with others are good with you and good with others but only in microfinance are good with you good with others in microfinance and non microfinance because then why wouldn't you want to do business with those customers are good with you in microfinance but not good with you uh, are good with you in microfinance but not good with others in uh, loans apart from microfinance these are essentially different customer segments and it is the sum of these segments that is actually your portfolio your portfolio is is at least in our view not or should not be restricted to the loans that you have given out it should look at who are your customers what are they doing in all the loans that they are doing so what are some portfolio actions for sustainability today a lot of you take industry inside to look at your portfolio but today a lot of you actually structurally look at only mfi as a portfolio so let me ask you this is it not a relevant piece of information for you to know in pin code 40071 if there are 10 borrowers with an aggregate exposure of one uh, with an aggregate exposure of 1 lakh in microfinance and if there are four borrowers with an aggregate exposure of 1 lakh across microfinance and non microfinance whether those borrower segments behave differently so why are you looking at today a market inside purely from an mfi portfolio standpoint 
and why are you not looking at a market inside in terms of going down to the pin code looking at your aggregate borrow uh, looking at aggregate borrower exposures trying to understand what percentage of people in that pin code actually have a microfinance and a non microfinance loan and whether same exposure same vintage in microfinance and sim same exposure same vintage in microfinance plus non microfinance mean the same or mean different this differential information at least in my mind should be used not only from a risk standpoint but also from an opportunity standpoint so the first portfolio action that we think you should structurally imbibe is to stop looking at market insight from the pure microfinance portfolio and rather look at market insight or industry insight from an aggregate borrower behavior perspective The second, and we've spoken about this, is that you must do a comprehensive borrower view, whether you are doing it at underwriting, whether you are doing it at customer management. Absolutely essential because the underlying the underlying theme across all these portfolio actions is that your portfolio is not immune is not immune to your borrower behavior 20% of which is actually going out and taking a non microfinance loan so really at an underwriting standpoint it is a risk avoidance and we have done multiple studies on multiple portfolios of most of the organizations who are participating on this call and we can tell you that irrespective of pre demo post demo irrespective of geography there has been a case where your portfolio has gone bad and if you would have chosen to look at comprehensive you would have known at the point of underwriting that this borrower in this group actually has so much delinquency outside which you are not seeing today because you are looking at only microfinance from a customer management standpoint the use case essentially is to see the credit appetite is to see what are the products that they are taking is to see if they are actually going out and inquiring for a product which you have in your basket which is a non qualified portfolio product and then why would you not want to do that business if that person is actually either spending a larger part of his uh, wallet with you her wallet with you or he has actually demonstrated the ability to repay even outside the second portfolio action therefore is look at comprehensiveness don't look at microfinance loan as your world the third portfolio action is to look at collection benchmark and why do we say that you must look at collection benchmark for collections essentially uh, the point for you to note is that irrespective of covid or irrespective of demonetization it is material information for you to know whether your collection efficiency is okay with your competition in a certain peer group uh, in a certain geography because if it is not then when an event occurs and if you are worse off already then you will never be able to recover when an event occurs so this is essentially irrespective of the event the event has no correlation to this the other thing for you to look at from a collection standpoint is to see that if you were to offer a top up in which geography is there historical evidence to say that when a top up was offered in 6 months 9 months or 12 months the portfolio came back because what are your collection levers your collection levers are limited even post demonetization the industry experimented with top ups 
and the results showed that in certain geographies in certain uh, in certain kind of lender uh, experiments the portfolio did come back but the result is not unambiguous therefore for you the relevant piece of information is to know that in the geographies that you operate in is there an evidence that if you run a top up program portfolios come back does your collections improve the second piece of relevant information for you to do on a regular basis is to know that is your collection efficiency similar to that better than or worse off than your competition in the geographies that you operate now think of how this ties back to the industry insight and the comprehensiveness now if you know that in a certain pin code and i'll take the example of 4001071 and 4001070 two adjoining pin codes in one of these pin codes the number of mfi borrowers who take personal loans is also high but personal loan collections has actually gone down in that pin code in the same pin code your collection efficiency is slightly better than your competition can you still say with confidence that you will still continue to be better than your competition you can of course say with confidence if you take a structural action that recognizes that in that pin code pl collection efficiency has gone down and therefore you will work your collection strategy your collection execution in that pin code to factor that in that is why the third portfolio action for sustainability that we think should happen is a collection benchmarking exercise the fourth portfolio action is of course proactive monitoring the proactive monitoring in my view can happen from an early warning standpoint which is to say that uh, someone who is uh, good uh, paying you but has defaulted elsewhere and over here you may actually choose to say that i don't care about any defaults that are below uh, let's say 2000 rupees because it's a repayment on a top up loan maybe but you can actually get this information and look at look at this because for you the cohort that is most interesting is the people that who have not taken a moratorium and i will tell you why that cohort is very interesting because that cohort gives you the ability over a period of time to build a stress model separated out from the cohort who have taken a moratorium now therefore if you put that cohort on an early warning you will know whether the estimation or the confidence that you have in terms of the percentage of your book uh, the percentage of your value not being impacted is overestimated rightly estimated the other thing that we have seen is that existing borrower retention uh, to some extent has become a challenge and therefore you can also proactively monitor when the when your borrower is actually at towards the end of repayment of your loan to see whether there is an inquiry that is happening with another institution because if that customer is actually a multiple cycle customer if that customer has borrowed with you significantly why would you want to let go of that opportunity to understand if there is an increasing if there is a new credit need and you would want to uh, service that the fifth point 
is actually really to move from heuristic to predictive. Today, underwriting for an MFI or cross-sell from an MFI to uh, to a to a non-MFI product is actually a rule-based decision. Is actually a decision that looks at cycles. It looks at it looks at uh, uh, number of repayments. It looks at once delinquency, and you arrive at a rule. But increasingly, if your borrowers are actually going to borrow from other lenders and their inflation adjusted incomes are not going to increase to the extent to keep the debt service coverage ratio constant. You will be you will need to select the borrowers who may qualify in the rule, but which a predictive model is saying is actually not the right borrower to lend. Therefore, try to use a risk-based model and a propensity-based model. And as I said, the opportunity at this pause is actually to understand that your customers offer you a significant opportunity because of the behavioral change that your portfolio has undergone. And I will give you another context. The 20% that you saw, that percentage six months back was somewhere around 17% or 18%. So in, in six months, 2% of six crore borrowers, 2% of six crore borrowers, which is 12 lakh borrowers, 12 lakh borrowers have actually taken a loan from a non-MFI institution. Now, Therefore, this number is only going to increase and you to maximize the opportunity to maximize the opportunity, not just in terms of an upsell or a cross sell, but to maximize the opportunity of creating a portfolio that grows and that grows with an acceptable level of risk. You must move from heuristic to predictive. Uh, I will now try to answer the questions that you have. Uh, so if you can uh, keep the questions coming, uh, uh, that is good. I, I think we may have received uh, uh, multiple questions. Uh, and I will try to answer uh, as much as I can, uh, but please keep the questions coming. Okay, let me see. Uh, so one of the questions that we have is, uh, what is the percentage of borrowers in microfinance space who have availed the moratorium? We don't have that answer yet. Uh, because of the fact that we have not received uh, a lot of the updated data. Uh, as soon as we receive that updated data, we will uh, be able to answer that question. Uh, is moratorium till 31st May sufficient for micrograde borrowers? Can Bureau data give us more insights on what would be a more suitable period? Uh, Again, I think the answer to that is essentially uh, for you to look at uh, to look at uh, a scheme that is not purely driven by the regulator. So, if you refer one of the earlier points I uh, I mentioned was about studying with how the impact a top up loan does on the microfinance space. If you are able to study that in the geographies in which you operate. Uh, then you will be able, in my view, to get an answer as to whether there is a design that you can put in place beyond 31st May uh, to uh, actually uh, ensure that you return back to normal. And that can also give you an answer to the time frame in which 
people who have asked uh, the moratorium may actually need to return back to normal. Are there any dispersals in the microfinance space? Yes, but very minimal in April. Um, how do you see a change in consumer behavior post the lockdown is over? I think that uh, uh, I think that rural markets uh, will see uh, a demand of surge much much quicker than urban markets. Uh, I think also that rural household income may face some stress uh, in the short term, uh, but I would anticipate uh, that uh, immunity, uh, uh, I would anticipate that immunity to risk in these markets would also be higher. On the urban side, I think consumer behavior from a demand side will pick up in uh, online. Uh, much quicker than uh, uh, much much quicker than um, offline uh, because of the fact that we will be uh, more comfortable um, doing transactions where we know that there is no chance of an asymptomatic infection. So any online behavior uh, will actually pick up. So. Uh, and on the urban side, I think the impact of the migration or the reverse migration will be felt in some pockets as well. Uh, any further questions on this? We are happy to engage uh, separately. Uh, in the context of starting MSC business, is it possible to have segment or industry-wise behavior till April 30 by May end? I think by May end, it may not be possible uh, because of the fact that some of the directions of the Reserve Bank uh, in terms of reporting of moratoriums may actually need uh, uh, some changes in IT systems on the lender side. I definitely think, however, that data till uh, Feb end in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, whatever you are asking is, is uh, available. Uh, with a 24 to 36 month view also. Uh, the May, the April end data I think is uh, better in in terms of uh, uh, in terms of an availability standpoint I would say is uh, is mid of June. Trade Bureau data is essentially blah blah but how true is it now given that the world has changed beyond recognition hope you will address this issue in the webinar uh, i have addressed it in certain aspects as i said uh, the bureau data uh, is about looking at the borrower comprehensively uh, and building predictions on that uh, the comprehensive behavior is applicable to um, uh, the industry insights to collections and in and in moving from a heuristic to a predictive uh, so that definitely is a capability that exists and uh, i would encourage you to um, engage uh, on these lines if you reach out to your account manager we will be able to better understand what are the exact use cases you are trying to solve and then we may be able to provide you a better or a more relevant answer. What are the techniques, methods? What are the techniques and methods going to change in assessing the customer? What are the techniques or the methods going to change in assessing the customer? I think, uh, again, uh, I think the main the main change or the main thing that you should you should look at when you uh, when you work with the credit bureau specifically and i will restrict myself to that is is a, is in essentially uh, looking at that person comprehensively whether you are looking at it uh, at the point of acquisition or whether you are looking at it from taking a portfolio action uh, don't restrict yourself to looking at only the microfinance 
look at comprehensively you will get a better understanding of both the opportunity and the risk specifically the residual risk that you would have taken on your portfolio and if in the portfolio in the past you haven't used comprehensive views and have only used mfi views then it's an even bigger opportunity for you uh, to run a test on the past behavior and see how much of a material difference that comprehensive view would have made i think in terms of uh, the kyc uh, even microfinance to some degree is going to move towards digital kyc uh, uh, so so that is another change that i think is is going to happen i would not say that the change is change is going to happen in the next one month two months three months but definitely uh, even from a group formation standpoint or a kyc standpoint i think uh, there is going to be uh, a slight increase in the digital uh, relative to where we are today good chunk of vintage retail have availed less vintage of mfi loans does it mean to say existing retail customers yes is it because of easy credit assessment can we have delinquencies on this set of course you can have delinquencies on this set and as i said along with the delinquencies please also look at if in your portfolio you have not looked at comprehensive look at what impact a comprehensive view would have made on your portfolio once again please reach out to your crif account manager for a greater deep dive into this okay In addition to customers, there is a segment of customers using different ID to avail loans. So as per records, each customer ID may ask, but in reality, customers have uh, four to six loans. Yes, so that is the entire statement. I'm not sure what is the question here. Uh, if you can just send your question to interact at crifhimark.com. Uh, uh, then we will try to answer this because the question ends over here. It has been mentioned that the microfinance borrowers are traveling. It has also been mentioned, but irrespective of whether it is we or our competitor, fact remains that there is over leveraging. How do we address this risk? You look at comprehensive to first understand the debt. Uh, see the income part or the in or the growth in income. You don't have any control. So from a debt service coverage ratio, you really don't have any control on the denominator. The only thing you can control is the numerator. Um, today, you must know that people who are doing traditional retail asset loans are actually looking at not just the retail borrowing history, but also the microfinance history at the time of underwriting. Whereas as microfinance companies, you may not be looking at that. So first is look at that both at an underwriting and customer management standpoint and then you will be able to make those choices once you start looking at that then it is possible then it is possible to see what would have happened on your portfolio if you would have looked at that once you do that then there is a possibility to say that if this was would have happened on my portfolio what would have happened to my competition and can i do analytics on that the starting point is actually to look at things comprehensively uh, i would not un answer the i would not answer the point on over leverage because i think we can't control the denominator we can only control the numerator which is the debt and right now i think the opportunity for you is to look at the debt in a comprehensive manner and understand you it does not necessarily mean that you don't lend but it may need you to look at a different or a newer product design to say that if my retail debt is above one lakh rupees and uh, uh, in that debt there is still the worst delinquency in the last 12 months is 30 days then instead of giving a 30,000 as ticket size i will give a 20,000 as a ticket size that may be uh, that may be an outcome that you come to but start looking at that and you will arrive at that uh, you will arrive at the way out uh, anything that is more specific again please get back to your trip account manager and we will uh, we will uh, look at that 
um, I see that we have received a lot of questions. We've only been able to answer a very small percentage of that. Uh, however, the uh, the time for this webinar has ended. So what I'll do is I will look at the questions and uh, we will get back to you with answers to the question. Uh, for any further questions, interact at crefimark.com. Anything that you want to deep dive, please reach out to the respective CRIF account managers. We are happy to engage and try to work with you to the best of our ability on what is the need that you have and try to solve for that need. Uh, the needs will be different. For example, IL is is a IL could be a very different need across different different organizations, and we will try to work with you to understand each of your individual organization's needs before we say that this is what is right for you. So reach out to your account managers or send the questions to interact at crypto.com whatever questions we have received and i have not answered we will answer that to you uh, through email thank you for joining this webinar uh, thank you for being our patron uh, and we look forward to continue to deliver even greater value to you in the coming days thank you so much have a good day uh, stay safe